This video and every video on this channel is made possible by your support on patreon.com slash 616 entertainment. I couldn't do this without you and your contributions keep this channel alive. You can also grab an official shirt over on prowrestlingtees.com slash 616 entertainment. What's up, Dan Dans? My name is Ian. Welcome to Mortal Kombat Monday. Now, you may have noticed in the early going here that this is indeed going to be an audio-only episode, and if you're a little new around here, let me tell you why. Back in December of 2019, we started reading the Mortal Kombat novel written by Jeff Rovin. Now, let me catch you up to speed real quick. This novel sucks. It's written very poorly. It takes great liberties with the source material, and basically we've just been, over the past couple of years, reading through this four to five chapters at a time, doing silly voices, and we're going to get through this whole book. I've been promising it this whole time. Here in Season 3 of Mortal Kombat Monday, we are going to finish this novel, and then at some point I'll release it as a mega audiobook. The worst audiobook of all time, so... <laughs> Go ahead and minimize this window if you want to. Sit back and uh, I will regale you with the tales of the Mortal Kombat novel written by Jeff Rovin. We are picking up at chapter 24 and I do realize it's been quite a while since we have uh, touched on this novel at all. The last episode that went up of Mortal Kombat Monday that centered around this novel went up September 13th, 2021. So the links to all of the prior episodes, which contain chapters 1 through 23, are indeed in the description. Feel free to uh, listen to those if you want. It's a, it's a fucking chore, but I think it's a chore that we're having fun doing together. Now, without further ado, I'm going to jump back in here. I don't remember who... Uh, take two. I don't remember what any of these characters' voices sound like. I do impressions for everybody to add to the silliness factor, but I don't remember what anybody sounded like, so we're either gonna guess, or I'm just gonna make up new ones. And if you were wondering, am I really reading this book, or am I just, did I look it up online, and I'm reading off the screen? This is a novel. There you go, there's some page turning for you. Handy Dandy, Andy Jarek, the rough and tumble bad boy who never takes no for an answer, always plays by his own rules, took the Pittsburgh Steelers all the way to the playoffs on Monday Night Blitz. He gave me this novel years ago and said, this book is terrible, you'll love it. So, here we go, chapter 24. When he was a child, growing up in the Honan province of China, Liu Kang used to play a game with his year-old brother, Chow. One of them would sneak up on the other and pounce when he least expected it. The only time and place this was forbidden was when they were mending their father Lee's fishing nets. Everything else was fair game. One of them was asleep, one of them was courting, even when one was using the chamber pot. To make it more interesting, the brothers kept score. Each surprise and takedown was worth two points for the attacker. Each surprise followed by a takedown by the defender was worth three points for the defender, none for the attacker. What? Okay, jumping in already. What the fuck? Why, why do we have to know all this? The fucking rules of their sneak up game? Really? Jeff Rovin. Did you have a fucking quota on how many words you needed here? Good God. The boys recorded the score in a notebook, and at the end of 10 years, when Lou left home to visit the United States, the score was 18,250 for Lou, 18,283 for Chow. Lou had insisted that the decade's worth of scores be retoted, and for all he knew, Chow had done it. But shortly after he reached the United States, his parents died in a plague and his brother disappeared. To where, why, and how, he never learned, though one day he vowed he would. As he approached the village of Wuhu, Lu had experienced feelings like those of long ago when he used to sneak up on Chow. It was the middle of the night, so he had expected most of the lanterns in the village to be off. But usually there was some movement, even at this hour. Far take two. Farmers delivering eggs, water carriers filling jars from the well, someone staggering home or sleeping in the street after a night of merriment. 
There was none of that here, which was why Lou and his two White Lotus companions had decided to sneak into the village, sticking to the shadows behind and beside the huts and a few public buildings, removing their sandals so the stones and dirt of the street didn't crunch beneath their feet. Dressed entirely in black, they weren't seen or heard. Lights were burning in the Temple of the Order of Light, and Lou had decided to go there. Perhaps one of the monks could tell him why it was so quiet, why he had this uneasy feeling that something was amiss. As they approached the bronze door of the great circular building, Liu Kang motioned for his companions to remain hidden behind the trees near the temple while he took a look inside. Creeping up to one of the open windows that looked in on the great library, Lou heard voices. Yeah, Jim. Yeah. There's <laughs> some guy fucking named Jim in the Temple of the Order of Light. <laughs> Sitting with his back to the wall, Lou pulled a throwing star from his belt and lifted it above the sill. He angled it so he could see the room reflected in its highly polished surface. What he saw got his attention. Two men were sitting on a mat. One of them, a young boy, had one end of a noose around his neck and a machine gun pointed in his direction. The man... Take two. The man to whose neck the other end of the noose was attached to was speaking into a telephone. I don't know who these people are, so I don't know what fucking voices to do. So for now, they won't have one. Yeah, he said. I understand. Yep, I gotcha. Bye. The man put the phone back in its flat, box-like cradle, and the boy strained against the leash. The bigger man gave a hard tug and the youth fell forward. Senman Joni walked to the boy's side to make sure he stayed down. Sorry, said Moriarty. What the fuck did Moriarty sound like? D did we give him like a stereotypical like Italian mobster sort of thing? Let's, let's do that. Let's just do goofy New York mobster fucker. Sorry, said Moriarty. But something must have happened out there. I got orders to frag you. But I'll make it quick and painless, I promise. As Senman Joni s stepped aside and Moriarty raised the gun to the boy's head, Liu Kang stood drew back his arm, and prepared to fling the throwing star at the killer's hand. Instead, Lou found himself with the wind knocked out of him as he flew sideways. And then, there was a terrible blast from inside the temple. Damn, so Senmen Joe Nee just got got, it sounds like, and somebody saw Liu Kang. He thought he was creeping in quiet, but I don't think so. That was chapter 24. We're on to chapter 25 already. How about it? Though Jim Wu's tax sat phone was hung up, the receiver bounced, riding two spikes of electricity, one from the mouthpiece, the other from the earpiece. Wu looked at Schneider and then at Shang Tsung and quickly what? And quickly scooped up the receiver. Okay, what the fuck does Wu sound like? I don't have a voice for Wu. Um <laughs> What the fuck should Wu sound like? <laughs> Okay, hello! <laughs> That's what Wu's gonna sound like. He waited. All he heard was static. Nada, he said, checking the connection, listening, then replacing the receiver. The line is very dead, but not from this end. It's like it got Wu's eyes fell on Raiden. Got what? Shang Tsung demanded. Is that what Shang Tsung sounded like? I don't remember. Wu said, like it got fried from the Tim side, but a bottle like of electricity of some kind. Or lightning, Shang Tsung said. A guttural sound rolled from the wizard's throat as he faced the thunder god. Is this your doing, Raiden? Unlike you, the thunder god said, I keep my word, but I only promise not to leave here. I said nothing about sending lightning. Shang Tsung considered what Raiden had said, then nodded. That's very true, Raiden. But while you may have saved the shepherd at the expense of my man, I promise you'll pay for that life tenfold, starting with your own. Goro, he said, it's time for our surprise. Drawing himself up to his full height, Goro smiled wickedly at Shang Tsung. What? As Shang Tsung hands begin to- What? Goro smiled wickedly as Shang Tsung's hands began to smoke anew. And second red bolt split the sky. What the, this fucking book is terrible. This is fucking horrible. That that whole what I just read you, uh, one full page. That was chapter twenty five. It's on to chapter twenty six. Which 
is less than half a page long. Did you hear that? Look, this is page 193. That's one page turning and there's nothing on the other side of the page. Wow, man, if we were committed to doing five chapters, this would be a 15 minute episode. Why, why are these split? Why are these chapters split? When the bolt of lightning erupted from somewhere above his head and struck Tim Moriarty and Senmen Joni, Chin Chin felt his ears ring like the temple bell and the noose go slack. When he saw the leather strap burned in the middle and Moriarty nowhere to be seen, he dove for cover beneath a heavy wooden table near the entrance of the room. And when the echo of the thunder died in his ears, he heard the sounds of struggle from without. Crawling through the library, which was thick and dark with smoke that used to be Tim Moriarty and Senmen Joni. Okay, so they got fucking burned to ashes. Chin Chin reached the window, put his finger on the edge, rose to his knees, and looked out. Ducking again just in time to avoid a wavy blast of ice rushing at his head. Oh shit, Sub-Zero's here. So now we're on to chapter 27, and I'm gonna skip ahead. How about it? Chapter 27 appears to be four whole pages. That's progress, man. That's progress. For all his years of sneaking around and being snuck up on, Liu Kang hadn't seen the pole coming. But his reflexes were still sharp, and the instant he felt the blow on his side, he rolled away, got to his feet, and backflipped to buy himself some distance to meet a second attack only to be caught in the fiery aura of whatever had exploded in the library. He'd managed to protect his face with his hands, but the explosion knocked him down again. And when his foe, who was crouching and was untouched by the blast, fired a projectile of his own, a sheet of ice that flew from his mask into the library window, Liu Kang knew whom he was facing. A sheet of ice that flew from his mask into the library... So does this Sub-Zero, did he just shoot ice out of his fucking face? I guess we're gonna find out. The White Lotus Warrior reached into his belt for his throwing star, only to find that it must have fallen out. Without taking his eyes off the dark shadow that was his enemy, he used his peripheral vision to find... Take two. To f Take three. To try and find something with which to defend himself. Without a weapon of some kind, he knew he was doomed. Without a weapon... He would never be able to withstand an assault from Sub-Zero. The infamous ninja was not someone any mortal warrior wanted to face. While it was presumed by the few who had encountered him and lived, the very, very few, that he himself was mortal, his ninja skills bordered on the supernatural. Yeah, you fucking think he's throwing ice. Coupled with mysterious abilities to radiate waves of cold and to move with the speed of a blizzard, they made him a force with which to be reckoned. Moreover, when Liu Kang's friend Guy Lai and Wilson Tong did not run to help him, he suspected that the ninja had already dispatched them. That too was a trademark of Sub-Zero and the Lin Kuei band. Divide and conquer. Victory, not honor, was all that mattered to them. But Liu Kang was too busy to mourn his friends. Whatever had caused that blast in the library had blown out the twisted remains of a submachine gun. Having hooked his foot beneath it and thrown it up to his hands, Liu Kang was able to use the broken weapon to parry a renewed attack from Sub-Zero's pole. High, low, low, jab, high, jab. The slender wooden weapon seemed like a propeller in Sub-Zero's hands as he whirled it this way and that, trying to strike his opponent. Liu Kang was able to block it, and with the twisted barrel of the gun, then with the stock, then the barrel again. I fucking hate how this guy writes. If only the gun hadn't been twisted into an otherwise useless mass in that explosion. Even a ninja was not immune to bullets. Then the stake- <laughs> so Liu Kang is just gonna open fire on Sub-Zero with a fucking machine gun. That would be a sight to see. We we're talking about honor. Oh, victory at all costs, not honor. And that's what, like, makes the Lin Kuei so fucking dangerous. Liu Kang is from the fucking White Lotus Society, and you're talking about, oh, if this gun wasn't broken, I'd fill him full of lead. Jeff Rovin. Fucking idiot. Then the stakes got higher as Sub-Zero flipped off the tip of the pole and exposed a seven-inch serrated knife. Jab, jab, slice. Jab, slice. This reminds me of the League. 
when Rafi is teaching the little kid how to swim. Swim, swim, stab. Swim, stab. <laughs> Liu Kang wasn't able to see Sub-Zero's face beneath his mask. Couldn't tell whether he was trying to kill him or just playing prior to a serious attack. Then the ninja managed to slide the bottom of the pole into the trigger guard of the gun and wrestled the broken weapon away. Liu Kang was once again weaponless, though in that same moment, he began to wonder if he were defenseless. In the time it took Sub-Zero to rip the gun from his hands, Liu Kang noticed a faint golden glow coming from his hands. He remembered having used them to protect his face and realized that the explosion might have done something to them. This wasn't the time to wonder what, how, and why, but when Sub-Zero swung the pole at him again from above, Liu Kang didn't jump out of the way. Instead, he dropped to one knee, reached up, and grabbed the pole. As soon as the wood touched his palms, he thought about the fire and the pole erupted into flames. If Sub-Zero was surprised, he didn't show it. Tossing the flaming pole aside, he breathed another icy blast at Sub-Zero, or at Liu Kang. So yes, yeah, Sub-Zero does have ice breath. Which, I guess in Mortal Kombat 3, he did have an ice breath fatality, but that was Kui Liang, and we're clearly dealing with Bi Han here. I realize I'm splitting hairs, but I don't like Jeff Robin's writing, so. <laughs> Who held his palms toward his enemy, once again thought of the strange glow, and sent a sheet of fire reaching out to meet the ice. The two waves met between the adversaries, raising a wall of steam between them and giving Liu Kang a chance to dive to his left, though the open window, take two, through the open window of the library. And I'm getting a fucking text message here. How very unprofessional. It's my podcast co-host, the artist formerly known as Mike Charles. He says that he cannot do the podcast this week. So I'll do it myself again solo, I suppose. Somersaulting as his shoulder struck the door, Liu Kang was on his feet in an instant and facing the window. There, breathing hard amid the dull orange glow of the lanterns, Liu, f Liu felt he stood a chance against the ninja, who relied on darkness to work his deviltry. I've never seen the word deviltry in my life. Time was measured by the rapid beating of his heart, and the attack never came. Instead of relaxing his guard, Liu continued to stand with one hand raised in front of his face, the other angled in front of his chest, his left foot resting only on its toes, prepared to deliver a roundhouse kick if necessary. When he'd leapt through the window, Liu had seen the boy cowering under the table and asked, What happened here? I... I'm not sure, said Chin Chin. I was about to be shot when white fire exploded over my head and shot through the window. It originated in here? Lou asked. Yes. One moment the room was as you see it. The next moment there was a heat and thunder everywhere. And then it was quiet again. Lou said, Whoever sent that fireball saved us both. But who could have done it? The boy asked. Kung Lao has forbidden the practice of magic, and we have been taught that the gods no longer interfere with the lives of mortals. Perhaps there are more than mortals we are facing, Lou said. For though it was true the priests taught that the time of the gods had passed, the thunder god Raiden was still the patron deity of the original Order of Light, and the flame that had been sent here was designed to save the boy without destroying the scroll take two, without destroying the scrolls and books. That the reason it had discharged through the window, Luz having been struck and empowered with the ability to radiate flame was probably just a very lucky consequence of Raiden's efforts to save this boy. And what a fucking run-on sentence that was. Unless you believe in fate, Liu Kang told himself, in which case perhaps I was supposed to be there. What? What the fuck? Unless you believe in fate, Liu Kang told himself, in which case perhaps I was supposed to be there. I don't, it's hard to tell how this is supposed to be read, because earlier Liu Kang's thoughts were in quotations and now it's just italicized, I don't, whatever. But it was difficult to believe in fate and in the benevolent protection of the gods, when he thought of his loyal friends probably lying dead outside. Why save him and not them? If anything, they were younger and more innocent. But this was not the time to ponder 
philo philosophical matters. There was a town to secure, and when that was done, he still had his mission. He glanced at his watch and thought of the lighted two of the other lives that were still at stake. Walking on the tips of his feet, Lou made his way back to the window. Standing several yards back, he'd fired a burst of flame into the night and quickly looked up to the right and then to the left. Sub-Zero was nowhere to be seen, though in the fast-fading glow, Lou saw the bodies of his comrades, their dead eyes open, thin red ribbons of blood around their necks. They'd been garroted with a thin cord that the ninjas carried. Caught from behind, unable to cry out as the wire or nylon was slipped around their throats and pulled tight. Sad and angry, Lou knew better than to run into the night, the ninja's element, seeking revenge. Someday, he would face Sub-Zero again, and things would turn out differently. In the meantime, somewhere out there was Sonya Blade, and he must get to her side as soon as possible. What the fuck? Alright, so... I don't know why I'm doing chapter summaries, but... Sub-Zero and Liu Kang fought, nobody fucking did anything. Everyone but Chin Chin is fucking dead. <laughs> chapter 28, you ready? Here we go. Looks like it's a couple pages long. When Shang Tsung's hands began smoking again, and the red flash exploded, Raiden's white eyes narrowed. He peered unflinching into the evil lightning, watching without fear for himself as it struck the earth between Goro and the wizard, and saw a tall shape begin to coalesce amid the ruby glow. A shape that was dimly human in form, but clearly not in stature. Shang Tsung said, it occurred to our all-knowing Lord Shao Kahn that perhaps I underestimated the Order of Light, the magician sighed. Well, perhaps that's so. No one likes to admit his weakness, but I'm only human after all. Just like Mr. Wu and Mr. Schneider, and this would-be plug-puller of a woman who I am compelled to believe was never my ally at all. The wizard cast her a knowing sideward look. Is that so? What the fuck? Who is he talking to? He's talking to Sonya? I don't even remember Sonya being here. Whatever, we're just gonna keep going. She rose from the trench and said proudly, I'm Sonya Blade, agent of the US Special Forces. Shang Tsung reacted with surprise. With so much on its mind, your mighty government has targeted me? I should be honored. They've targeted you at the request of the British government in Hong Kong, said the woman. As for me, I came here to get Kano. He's wronged you. Three years ago, he killed my fiance, Cliff LaDolce. <laughs> Cliff LaDolce. <laughs> Can you imagine if they got married? <laughs> the player select screen. Sub-Zero, Sonya LaDolce. <laughs> Woo! Okay, okay. The martial arts sensei, Shang Tsung asked. Kano was re <laughs> Kano was responsible for that? Sonya... Sonya... <laughs> Still thinking about LaDolce. Sonya nodded once. Then Kano must have attacked him from behind, Shang Tsung said. Or in the dark. LaDolce was said to have been a supreme martial arts master. Kano would never have dared to fight him. It was from behind and in the dark, Sonya said, rage in her voice. When Cliff refused to use his skills to fight for the Black Dragon Society, Kano shot... Kano. <laughs> Kano shot him with six slugs from a forty-five. That's Kano, said <laughs> Chase. <laughs> A living overstatement. When you vowed to find him, how almost unbearably touching. What? What? I'm just gonna move on. While they were speaking, the red bolt had faded and the new arrivals stood in the darkness. Raiden could see clearly that the others could not. That the being had a normally proportioned human body and head, though the lower half of the face was covered by a green mask with a series of horizontal slashes on either side. Liquid dripped freely from the openings where saliva stuck to the ground. Puffs of smoke arose. Fuck yeah, dude! Reptile's here! I fucking love Reptile. 
Acid. Oh, no. Acid, thought the god. There was only one outworld creature who was like that. Kano is a crude and heartless fellow, Shang Tsung admitted. But in my defense, he's not entirely without value. He's extremely greedy, and coupled with his physical prowess and ruthlessness, that makes him effective. Although I must admit, Shang Tsung said as he stole a glance at the new, at the new arrival, had I all of it to do again, I would never have hired Kano or any mortal to do God's work. To try and save a piece of your soul, and look what happens. Shang Tsung grinned with delight as he looked at Raiden. The Thunder God remained unflappable. Now then, Shang Tsung continued, Though I am leaving you, Raiden, my colleagues Goro and his outworld associate, Reptile, will be remaining behind. Reptile is the personal bodyguard of Lord Shao Kahn, so I expect you'll have your hands full. Shang Tsung regarded the god for a long moment. Okay. Unless, of course, realizing the hopelessness in your position, you'd care to throw in your lot with us. Raiden said nothing. After a moment, Shang Tsung shook his head. Too bad, said the wizard as smoke began to rise from his hand again. Though I'm not sure you would have enjoyed our little band. By the way, Mr. Wu and Mr. Schneider, you are hereby terminated. Though I do have one final use for you. Before the two of them could protest, they were swallowed in a burst of red and vanished. As for you, Miss Blade, Shang Tsung extended an arm toward her, palm out. You may have lost a fiancé and your quarry, but you've gained a very special honor. Red lightning flashed again, and when it faded, Shang Tsung and Sonya were gone, and Goro and Reptile were moving to the left and right of Raiden. Goro gurgling with delight, and Reptile drooling acid on the grasses beneath their feet. Wow. This is something. What about one more chapter? What do you think? Should we do one more? Let me get a sip of my deal here. I wanted to go get an iced coffee black, which was my go-to before I read this. But uh, my tire's going to blow out. My front passenger tire has a weird bubble on it, which is extremely unsafe to drive on. And that motherfucker's going to blast. So after I record this episode, I have to go out and jack my car up and take that, car, that tire off and replace it with the spare. Because the local place uh, who will replace it can't get a, a match for me uh, until the 22nd. I'm recording this on the 20th. So now you guys know about my day. <laughs> Let's get back to the book. Chapter 29. Goro reached out a massive arm and pointed a finger at Raiden. You cannot die, Thunder God, said the Outworlder. I don't know how long I can do that voice. But even immortals can be killed. And we're going to be the ones to kill you. What the fuck does that mean? You can't die, but we're going to kill you. <laughs> that was me hitting myself in the head with this book. Raiden continued to look straight ahead, watching his opponents from, his, from the sides of his eyes. The cold glow of those eyes and the stony set of jaw revealed nothing of what he may have been thinking or feeling. Okay. Goro's red eyes moved like little machines. That's a lights album. As he stepped closer from the left. On the right, Reptile's sharply down-slanted green eyes and sinister green face mask were unflappable. You just used that word two pages ago, Jeff. Dressed in a skin-tight black cowl, green leggings, black slippers, and a black bodysuit with green trim, he moved with a fluid grace that was lacking in his burlier companion. You talk too much, Goro. Oh, th this is Reptile. What the fuck does Reptile sound like? You talk too much, Goro, said Reptile, his sibilant voice sounding hollow behind the mask. I've never heard the word sibilant before. I do like that, Jeff. It, uh, is, wait, is this Goro? Yeah. It keeps my energy level up, said the brute moments before he ran at Raiden. Instead of meeting the charge, Raiden vanished and Goro found himself running directly toward Reptile. But the serpentine outworlder avoided the collision by leaping out of the way. He grabbed a low-hanging tree branch and swung up into it. Moments before, a lightning bolt fired by Raiden from a higher branch sliced through it and sent Reptile crashing to earth. Reptile was on his feet in an instant, hissing loudly, his fingers curled like claws. 
Goro dug a massive foot into the ground to stop his forward momentum, then turned toward Raiden. Fight, coward! Goro bellowed. Dalt, Reptile said to Goro. He uses his brain, which is the most effective fighting tool of them all. I don't know. That sounds like my Shang Tsung, doesn't it? <laughs> Fuck. Drawing back his head, Reptile spit acid at the base of the tree. The bark crackled and popped beneath the steady stream of vile green fluid. But Raiden had already somersaulted off the tree and landed behind Reptile before it fell. He air-kicked the outworlder from behind as Reptile stumbled forward. Raiden leapt onto his back, simultaneously knocking him ahead and using him as a springboard. He landed on the Serpent Man's back with a jump kick, causing Reptile's arms and legs to splay out. Raiden had already vaulted off his foe and was standing, facing Goro, when the four-armed giant charged. This time, Goro lunged the last few feet and managed to catch the leaping Raiden about the thighs. Goro wrapped all four arms around the Thunder God, tackling him and landing with his left shoulder in Raiden's midsection. He quickly put two hands on the wrists of the day's thunder god, pinning them so he would be unable to aim his fire. I'll still take muscle over mind every time, Goro said as he peered down at his captive. Hit him, Reptile yelled as he climbed to his feet, shaken by his run-in. He can still! Even before the words were out, Raiden had vanished in a flash of light, and Goro fell forward on the bare earth. Damn, said the outworld. Said the Outworlder, I forgot, behind you! Goro spun as Reptile yelled, but he was too late to avoid the Thunder God's roundhouse kick. His foot caught Goro in the side of the jaw and literally spun him around so that he landed on his back. Raiden swung his arms around and pointed them at his foe, but before he could fire his lightning, Reptile leapt at him, vanishing in the midst of an air kick. Raiden had begun take two. Raiden had begun to get out of the way, checked himself when Reptile disappeared, then went flying backward as the Outworlder's foot struck him high in the chest. Getting my head of myself. See, I'm getting head of take three, I'm getting ahead of myself here. I'm reading too fast, because this is an action sequence. I'm trying to keep the energy up. But it's hard, I'm getting ahead of my words. Uh this is Reptile, okay. You may be able to teleport, the fighter said in an eerie, aspirating voice, but can you make yourself invisible? Raiden had the air kicked out of him as a knee came down hard at his belly. He managed to fire a lightning bolt ahead of him, saw the silhouette of Reptile fly backward in the blast, then lost him again as the glow disappeared, replaced by the charging Goro. The giant was snarling with anger and moving faster than before. His top two hands reached for Raiden's neck, but the Thunder God dropped down, extended his legs straight before him, placed the bottoms of his feet against Goro's belly, and used the giant's own momentum to lift him and flip him over. But though he had been caught off guard, Goro had managed to stretch an arm behind him. With his monstrously long reach, he latched onto Raiden's left foot, and as the Thunder God was being pulled over, Reptile air-kicked him in the exposed, vulnerable small of his back. Raiden glowed dully, trying to teleport, but was unable to muster the strength. He's done for, Goro said, scampering from all six... from all sixes to his feet. I get it, instead of all fours, all sixes. Raising a leg and bringing his foot down hard between the Thunder God's shoulder blades. We've beaten Raiden! Move aside, Reptile hissed. I want to dissolve this relationship. <laughs> what a line. What a line. Goro lumbered several paces to the side as his companion drew back his head. Raiden managed to get his right hand beneath him, raised himself to his left side, and looked at his enemy. He was trying to muster his strength, intending to push away at the last possible second before Reptile spit his acid. His arm was trembling and he wasn't sure he could do it. Suddenly, Reptile went flying, propelled by the feet of a figure in black. The figure's legs were stretched before him, his back facing down, while Reptile... 
take two. While his feet were still in contact with Reptile, the newcomer did a pirouette so that he was facing down. And Reptile flew in one direction, the figure in black landed on his hands, did a handstand that became a handspring, landed facing Goro, and pummeled him with a deadening series of uppercuts. The startled giant took several swipes at the figure who ducked, punched him in the lower belly, and jump kicked him in the chin. The bronze-skinned brute staggered back and fell against a tree which shook and dropped twigs all around him. Those precious seconds were all the time Raiden needed to get to his feet. My name is Liu Kang, the figure, the, the figure in black said to the Thunder God as the two stood back to back, awaiting a renewed charge. Reptile was on one knee, his arms cocked at his side. Goro was rubbing his jaw as he stepped away from the tree. Thank you, Liu Kang, said Raiden. Leave now. This fight is not yours. I've heard of this four-armed goon, he said. I don't know who this is. Is this Raiden or Liu Kang? And if you're fighting Kano and Shang Tsung, the oh, this is Liu Kang. <sighs> this is my fight. Reptile came forward chuckling in incongruously. Never heard that word before. As he brushed leaves and grass from his tights. Okay, this, so this is Reptile saying this. I too thank you, Liu Kang, he said. Now Raiden has someone to worry about. He cannot simply teleport away. I can take care of myself, Liu Kang said. Goro, Goro renewed his attack with a roar, and the White Lotus warrior met it with a roundhouse kick to the top of his left arm. But Goro blocked the kick, wrapped his upper left hand around the mortal's shin, and twisted hard. You mother realmers amuse me, Goro laughed. Though as he spun Liu Kang around, the young man stiffened his other leg, which, cartwheeling toward the giant, caught him in the cheek as it came around. Goro dropped the smaller mortal, who landed cat-like as a lightning bolt flashed over his head. The explosion caught Goro in the middle of in the middle and doubled him over. After which the renewed Raiden spun to meet Reptile's charge with a second burst. Reptile air kicked, rising above the bolt, landing beside Raiden on the Thunder God's right. While the two exchanged a series of punches, interspersed with blocks and kicks, Liu Kang ducked and weaved to stay out of the reach of the enraged Goro, catching the giant with the occasional sweeps and crouch kicks. And then both the Raiden... <laughs> this, I'm, this is getting hard to keep up with. We're almost done, though. And then both Raiden and Liu Kang froze as icy clouds covered each of them. Hey, Sub-Zero is about to show up. Goro and Reptile stood back and gazed into the brightening skies of the east, whence the sheets of ice have come. What? A figure was walking toward them from the rising sun. A man dressed in blue and black, with a metallic mask over his mouth, and a black hood pulled over his eyes. Uh, so I guess this is Sub-Zero's voice, but I don't know what he's supposed to sound like. You know, he said, it's rather refreshing to make an entrance like that, rather than sneak and skulk as I am wont to do. Who are you? Reptile asked as he looked from the stranger to Raiden, who was covered in a layer of ice several inches thick. I am working... I, what did he sound like, Sub-Zero? I am working for Shang Tsung. <laughs> These voices are all melding together. There's too many fuckers here. <laughs> <laughs> As I gather you are, I was hired to dispatch the White Lotus Blossom on the right. As for the one on the left, he said as he reached the Outworlders, consider him a gift from Sub-Zero. Holy shit, alright, that's the end of chapter 29, and that's the end of this episode of Mortal Kombat Monday. We just did... What, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29? We just did six more chapters in the Mortal Kombat novel by Jeff Rovin. We are now up to page 213, and it looks like this book rounds itself out at 293, so we have 80 pages to go. Dan Dan's, if you want me to continue reading this novel soon, let me know in the comments. If uh, you want me to keep these few and far between, let me know as well. I love ya. Cracking all my knuckles here. I gotta go fucking replace my tire. What a jolly day. I love ya.
and I'll see you next week.